In the heart of Guadalajara, Mexico, is what was known as the Habanas Hospice. Today it serves as a UNESCO site, and it was originally commissioned by the Catholic Church and approved of by King Charles IV of Spain in 1803. Although today, few know of the history and the true meanings of what lies inside. Nowadays it's called the Cabañas Museum, but on its beginnings it was known as the House of Charity and Sorrow. It was done by the Bishop Cabañas to give all the poor people and orphans a house to live in. The whole building is two and a half acres long, and it was done in only five years, and it's one of the finest examples of neoclassical architecture. The whole building is also symmetrical. The rooms on the left side were all for the girls and the rooms on the right side were for the boys. Mm -hmm. And that slightly minor shuffle on the background was used as some sort of kitchen and dining room. By the moment this place opened, briefly after, the Independence War of Mexico started. So it was taken as a military headquarters during its first 18 years. The bishop died and they renamed it Hospicio Cabañas, or Cabañas Hospice, from the 1828 and until the very 1980. It worked as an assistance house or home during 152 years, in which, aside from the Independence War, it also was held as a military headquarters in all of the other wars of Mexico. This main chapel was used for the Catholic Mass, until 1938, in which Orozco was hired to do these 57 paintings, which he could do in only 11 months. Two years that he was in Guadalajara, he actually did other two spaces with fresco paintings. Well, along muralism, there were 260 different painters registered that were being paid by the government. But Diego Rivera, David Alfaro Siqueiros, and José Clemente Orozco were the ones choosing which kind of painters will be working. That's why there are only 33 women in muralism. Mm. Frida Kahlo, probably the most famous painter of Mexico, was a teacher of the fresco painting itself that all of these muralists were do doing all along the country. But Frida Kahlo was Diego's wife. Due to Diego Rivera's stubbornness, he didn't want Frida to actually make a mural painting, even though she talked a lot of painters that later did major murals in the country. The thing was, during the Civil War, the main fight started because a president stood in the power like for 40 years and he was giving the French people a lot of benefits from the Mexican workers. So after getting the French out, we were poor and needed foreigner investment in our country to recover from that economical depression. In 1911, General Venustiano Carranza had removed the dictator Parfilio Diaz. When the revolutionaries were besieging the capital, he switched sides and installed himself as the first president of the Republic of Mexico. He was supported by many, including the young satiric artist Jose Oresco, while working at La Vanguardia, or The Vanguard, because he was a revolutionary himself and believed in his cause. By May of 1920, Venustiano Carranza was assassinated by his own revolutionary soldiers. Revolutionary leaders then installed General Alvaro Abrigan to be the next president of Mexico. And the new Minister of Education, Jose Vesconcelos, implemented a new rural education program and hired those 260 muralists that Oscar explained previously. This was done to inspire the masses to want to learn how to read, as the illiteracy rate in Mexico at that time was over 90%. 
the movement in which Orozco, Diego Rivera, Frida Kahlo, David Alfaro Siqueiros, and most of the most renownable painters in Mexico are associated with. It's the new Mexican muralism, an effort the country was doing after the Civil War to mm. put all people in the same place, to mm. make them think that the skin color, nature, the nationalities were important to our country to grow back to its glorious days. Mm. So, most of the 260 different painters, aside from painting this idea of a mixed race and the history of our country, were also communists or socialists. And this made a strong like, progress into Mexican politics and especially agreements between the capitalists and the proletariat, you know? Workers started to organize and such. More than talking about the glorious days of our country, it was supposed to establish a new idea of an identity. The mixed race identity in which the indigenous people of Mexico had mixed with the Spaniards or other kind of Europeans. That's why most of the paintings are nice and, you know, kind of romanticizing the indigenous costumes and putting the Spaniard soldiers shaking hands with the indigenous. That actually was kind of a major sin. And Orozco disagrees. He wants to paint grievance and pain because he knows people is gonna be shaken about that and wake up and start to work for themselves, criticize their patronizers or the four workers that are dominating every time, every kind of masses along history. Here, most soldiers are turned into robots because Orozco thinks of them as tools that do not have heart or brain, they just follow orders. Actually, the conquest led us without more than 600 different indigenous peoples, communities and ideas. We nowadays only have 68. And well, Orozco is also really recognized on how he can mix the structure and values of the building, because he wanted to be an architect, with how the murals are done. For instance, the cross shape of the chapel helps him work in some sort of contrast message. We have war itself on the right, we have ideologies and religions on the left, we have the indigenous people dominating each other on the vertical part, and the other religions over the indigenous people in that very bold. So the center, it's supposed to be some sort of shot of hope if we are ever going to be free. The Man of Fire has many readings possible as people is on Earth because Orozco didn't say a thing about no murals. Well, these pieces are Orozco's shot on his present. The workers that were close to work until they were practically dead in the concentration camps are painted as some kind of steps. So we can think when that guy is tired of using the whip and shouting, he can climb over them and turn himself in the guys that are in the last painting. You need not much of an imagination to know what he means by that. Even one of the comrades of Jose Oresco, David Siqueiros, was even involved in an assassination attempt on Trotsky after being exiled from the Soviet Union by Stalin. This is a really special painting because it's the last one Orozco did on this chapel. Orozco ended his work in only 11 months, but his contract stated that he had to work for 18 months. So, to get those 7 months payments before and leaving Guadalajara as soon as possible, he painted the portrait of the governor Everardo Tupete in that very mural. After he got his money, he came back here, scrapped the fruit off the face of the governor and painted over that ornament that seems like a chalice with some ribbons hanging, but it's supposed to be the silhouette of the head of an ox. Mm. Like telling the governor itself he was an ox or some sort of carrying animal. By the 1980, they decided to close the Cabanas Hospice because of the importance of these murals and 
surely because this place was hecking expensive to be kept on its feet and it's actually a really important historical witness to our country. So they closed the hospice, started working on the Cabañas Cultural Institute that opened in the very first century of Orozco's birthday, November 23rd in the 1983. And the children that were still living here were sent to a new home called Cabañas Home in the south of the city. What is the hope that Aresco is trying to show us in this mural? To avoid the apocalyptic end that humanity is heading towards. It seems clear to me that Aresco was not ignorant to the soon judgment that he would face from a righteous God. He chose not to retain God in his knowledge and consciousness, rejecting him. But there is still hope for many, for some are saved through compassion and others by fear pulling them out from the very fire that would have led to their destruction. <laughs>